Well, I'm in London in my gym jams because it's so late. And Dan is as ever. Is it a new cap or not today? Is he spoiled? Same old, nope. Same old. No, same old, same old. If you want a new hat, just say the word. I will make sure that for our next get together, I will have a different boxing baseball hat on. And I'll go even further than that. I want you to put questions here or, or, or requests that Dan wears specific hats. Because you know the fights he's been at, you know? I might but get my... I haven't, I haven't gotten a new hat from a fight in a number of years. I, you know, I used to get them uh, early on. And then every now and then, you know, you, they'd give them out in the press room or there'd be like in a thing at the, you know, if there was like a little press gathering, you know, to watch like 24 seven, it would give some stuff out and there would be a hat there. So I pick a few up like that over the years. But I hadn't really bought a hat in a long time. So it's probably not since about, I don't know, 2000 and maybe eight or nine or 10 that I probably don't have any hats post that year. But I got a bunch from, from before. There's some lovely things. I've got a little stack of MGM uh, fight report notebooks where they've even got a line yep. scoring the fights, uh, scoring the fight in each round as well. In fact, I've a couple of them I have not, are unblemished because I just want to keep them as, as untouched, you know. Well, Gareth, anybody that knows anything about me that may follow me on social media knows I'm a big collector. So I'm always tweeting out pictures of my programs and my posters and credentials and, and just different uh, knickknacks that I've collected over the years. So hats are like low on the totem pole for me though. I've always wanted to put all my um, credential lanyards and, cre and credential cards on one big collage. I've got on my, on my stairs. They wouldn't all fit though, would they? No. I mean, I mean it'd, be, it'd, it'd have to be a big eight by eight or something. Uh, it um, wouldn't even fit that. I mean, I, if I hung up all my credentials, I don't know if there's enough room in my, in yeah. the, they've got hundreds and hundreds of them. I've got two big boxes up in the attic of them. And I've got one on my stairs. I've got um, on, 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 the, on the acorns on my stairs. I've been leaving them on there every time I come home for about the last three years. That's and what I do. I put them on the string it. and there they are. Yeah, it's amazing. It is, and, and sometimes, you'll know this, because sometimes you have a glance at them or you just sift through them and you go, oh, it's unbelievable the number of fights you've been at, you know? And I've kept them in like roughly, you know, chronological order. You know, oh, you're just a freak. You're a fight freak. Well, no, because I take the main string, and yeah. not all the credentials are the same, but you'll know what I'm talking about. The company, Magna Media, Andy Olson and those guys who do a yeah. great, most of the big fights we cover in Vegas, and they do fights other places also. So they have like usually a standardized, at least size of the credential. And so they fit very nicely on one of those, uh, you know, strings. And you can, you know, fit whatever, how many. So you just, you can almost flip through them like a deck of cards. And funnily enough, the photo of me with their one for the MGM, it's probably about 15 years old. You're mine probably too. about 25 uh, on the photo of that one. I think mine is from when I was 30 years old. I have jet yeah. hair and a full beard. Uh, it's uh, a long time ago. Funnily enough, last night, and I have got into watching docus about boxing now, and I wasn't before. Last night, the Klitschko docu was on in German with subtitles, and you are totally dark-haired in that. Yes, I am. I remember that. I recorded that interview. 2009. 2010? I don't remember the year that we did it, but I know that I was in Atlantic City covering whatever fight I was in Atlantic City covering. And uh, the folks that were making the film uh, arranged for me to go to a, a different hotel in Atlantic City that I went like, you know, say like the fight was on Saturday night, probably like Saturday morning. I went to their hotel and spent probably like 90 minutes, maybe two hours taping uh, the interviews for that documentary. And they, That's three little clips. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't remember exactly how many uh, of, of me was in the, in, the, uh, in the film, but it was a very good and well done documentary. Oh, it was brilliant. Of their, uh, you know, what they had done, both, both brothers. And, and the, yes, it was both, both brothers. And, and the funny thing was, at the time, Vlad's English is not as comfortable as it is now. And he spoke a lot of German. And, and there wasn't very much English at all from him then, you know. He was much well, more stilted. He was, because he spent so much time living yeah. in America and, uh, and, and fighting in America, well, fighting later on, you know, earlier on, and then a long stretch in Germany, but then fighting back here again. But living for the, you know, for long stretches in Florida and, you know, being around so many English-speaking people all the time, you know, his English got to be, you know, very, very, very uh, solid. I mean, totally, he, he had an accent, but he could speak fluent. No You've always had a lovely relationship with him, as I have. I went to, to on a, on a, on a charity project with the fight for peace with him and sat in his car for, 
for three hours and went deep into his um, Soviet education at boarding school, Soviet sports school, had a lovely day with him. But you were one of the few in America who was very close to him, but he never really conquered America in, in as much as he could have, did he? That was by his choice. I mean, he, he came here uh, at one point and was going to fight here on a regular basis. His first title defense when he won his, first, uh, his second world title was in America against Calvin Brock. And, and he uh, oh, wanted to yeah. Yeah. in here. Um, and then, you know, it got to a point where uh, the money and the opponents, frankly, you know, were in Europe. So it made more sense for him to be able to go sell out a 60,000 seat soccer stadium to fight an opponent that was from another country in Europe. Uh, and the amount of money that his uh, network in Germany was paying for those fights. Right. And it did come to America where the license fee from HBO was, uh, was much less and the timing was not good for the European time zone, and the opponents were not known to Americans. So he would have done solid crowds in places like New York, but it, it just made more sense for him to, to, to fight there. It wasn't until, you know, later on where he came back a couple of times to fight in the States. But, uh, you know, I always had a, a very good relationship with Vladimir. We still talk uh, from time to time. He'll ring me up every now and then, or, or I'll email him about something or other. But, you know, Vladimir is, a, you know, boxing aside, he's just a good human being. I agree. And, and, it was to my benefit that he fought in Germany and Switzerland and all over the place so many times because I got to cover almost all of those fights. And he really did get loved and adopted by Germany and Hamburg and, you know, where, and, and, and he, he's as much loved in Germany as a fighter. I mean, he was responsible for a major boxing oh, interview yeah. in Germany well, for about seven years, Dan. After he won the gold medal, when he turned pro, he did so with Universal Box Promotion, which is you know, at that time was the biggest promoter in Germany. They had a great TV deal over there. They had a whole bunch of top quality championship level fighters that they put on a basis. They built up Vladimir and his brother. And even though the, their relationship did not end in a great way and they ended up splitting up, uh, you know, Universum and Peter Cole and uh, the matchmaker, Haiti Tao Muhammad, the late Haiti Tao Muhammad, my dear friend who passed a few years ago, you know, they were largely responsible for helping build the Klitschko name and making them, uh, you know, household names essentially in, in Germany. And, uh, and that's continued to fight even after that promotional, uh, uh, this, you know, promotional relationship dissolved. And he still spends time in Germany. He still has an office in Germany. Um, and, you know, really, he spends time in America. Uh, he has a home in Florida, a place in New York. He spends time in Germany. He spends time in, uh, in Ukraine, obviously. Um, uh, he's a man of the world. He's involved with a lot of businesses, does a lot of traveling. He's got a young daughter. And, uh, you know, having, I think, a lot of success in, in the business world post-boxing. Uh, but I was very happy and fortunate to be able to travel to London uh, to cover what turned out to be his final fight in that great fight we saw against Anthony Joshua. Yeah, absolutely. April 2017 seems like a long time ago now. And you never got, I assume, to go to his training camp in Stanglevert um, up in the mountains, which was amazing. I think I went there. It's got to be 10 times then, you know? Well, I will um, tell you this, though. I may not have ever got to go there. But we had to, like Vladimir and I had a joke kind of between us because every time he would prepare for a fight and he was training in, uh, in those mountains, uh, you know, I would uh, arrange to do an interview with him, a pre-fight interview, usually like, you know, two weeks before the fight or 10 days before the fight, before he traveled to the fight venue. And it got to a point after having done so many interviews time and time again during the training camp, he would joke around with me about how, like, he didn't feel like it was an official training camp until, like, you know, Rayfield, you pulled. I did, you know, he did their interview with Rayfield before he left for the fight. There you go. Well, that's, that's fame for you, baby. Um, <laughs> and also, we've got to mention his brother here, uh, Vitaly, who is doing an extraordinary job as the mayor of Kiev at the moment. And uh, mark my words, I know that he's only got a certain number of seats in the parliament. I still think he's the third party in terms of numbers. Yeah, but I think you're right. Yep. I think he's, I, I do really think that Vitaly, maybe in five, six years' time, will go on to be president of Ukraine. Wouldn't shock me. Listen. Even though the Klitschko's had a rap against them where they weren't necessarily in the most exciting fights in the history of boxing, and Vitaly more so in better fights than Vladimir over the years, but neither one was known to be in, like, super exciting fights. But that said, two of the best heavyweight fights I ever covered, probably number one and number two in terms of in person, was fights in, were fights involving the brothers. One was yeah. the fight between Vitaly and Lennox Lewis in Los Angeles, and the other was uh, the fight that we just mentioned, which was uh, Vladimir and uh, Joshua. I mean, oh, that, that Vladimir Joshua fight, apart from the fact it was in our national football stadium with a record-breaking crowd of whatever it was, 90-odd thousand, yeah. it had everything, that fight. It had 
everything. A young Tyro coming up against a wizened old experienced master who still believed he had one great fight in him. They both go down, Klitschko early. Joshua's celebrating like he's won <laughs> through his inexperience. Yep, he gets yep. decked by that big right hand. And then we have this incredible time when, he, when Joshua's surviving and then Joshua has a second wind in the fight. I don't think Joshua would have escaped from the prime Klitschko when he was hurt, you know. I Probably really, not. You know? Probably not. It's, uh, you know, it's hard to say, but, you know, he still had a lot left in that fight. And, and as I have thought to myself, you know, even though he didn't win, that was a great way to go out because it left the crowd wanting more. He showed that he could still compete at the highest level, even if he didn't get the W. And there was no reason and really nothing. I, I think he realized that even though he had the right to a rematch, there was probably nothing he could do better than he did that night and that Joshua was probably going to be able to get better and maybe learn from what had happened in that, you know, he gave it a great shot and, you know, didn't win, but nothing to be ashamed of. And look, at the end of the day, he'll waltz into the Hall of Fame on the first ballot when he's eligible, and uh, which is going to be next year because they lowered the, the threshold of eligibility from five years with no fight to three years with no fight. Three, yeah. Here's the thing people don't realize about Vladimir Klitschko. No other human being who ever lived – ever appeared in more heavyweight world title fights than Vladimir Klitschko, who appeared in 29 heavyweight title fights, you know, and granted, he didn't win them all. He lost, uh, you know, I think three of them or four of them at the most, uh, but well, let's see, Joshua. Um, no, it's three. Uh, and uh, and uh, Corey Sanders. Yeah. The other loss was a non-title fight when he fought Ross right. Pierce back earlier in his career. But anyway, the point is, he had a, he had a his record in heavyweight title fights just in title fights is the record that a lot of guys have when they retire, you know, let's say, you know, 26 and three or whatever, mm. so, you know, he was a, he was a, he was a great fighter. He dominated the era and uh, was a good, was a good guy. He's a good guy. Look, a quick flick over. Um, great stuff to bring up there. Um, That's how uh, it, by the way. So the people are watching though, like we sort of roughly plan out what we're going to talk about. Not like specific, every little detail, but like the general topics. That was not something planned. That's just sort of, you know, come up when, when it, whatever brought it up. So Well, it's, as we've said so many times, it's just like what we get into when we're sitting around at, at fight exactly. events and we have some, you know, some dinner. Um, yep. Look, we don't have to stay on it long. I know you've got a couple of points to make, but um, we had the third of the uh, ESPN top rank cards last night or our early morning um here in uh, in the uk uh, your nights last night your evening rather in, in america um and i i watched um your annoyance actually at the antonio de marco giovanni santian um fight which dave moretti scored 95 95 and he's a good judge um but uh, two judges had it 96 uh, 94 steve weisfield and tim cheatham for de marco um, sorry, for, for Santian, rather. Um, yeah. It was a 10-round uh, um, uh, welterweight fight, of course. You were annoyed by the scoring, weren't you? Yeah, and I wasn't the only one. I mean, I, I, the, my opinion was that, that, uh, that uh, DeMarco, who, look, he was, the, so, you know, he was supposed to be the trial horse for Santian to see if he could get over to the next level. He had a great record. I think he was 25-0 and 0 coming into the fight, but had never really fought anybody. DeMarco is like a, a very uh, experienced veteran, former lightweight uh, title holder, you know, has been in with a lot of top quality guys and always gives a good fight and a good effort. And, uh, you know, was the underdog. And the idea was, can Santion, can he, can he get up to the next level? And to get there, you got to beat a guy like Antonio DeMarco. Obviously. I thought DeMarco fought a heck of a fight. It seemed to me he, he pretty much won probably about the first four or five rounds at least, which right there at five rounds, it's a draw at the worst. And, he, you know, maybe he lost a couple of rounds near the end of the fight. But I just felt like, you know, he was out hustling the guy. He was out landing him. Uh, you know, he was landing a lot of clean punches. He was the boss. He was the boss of the fight, as they say. And, uh, you know, I, it's not the most controversial decision I ever saw. It's probably not in the top 100 controversial decisions. But it just, it just, I felt bad for DeMarco because he's a guy where at this stage of his career, that loss can, you know, can take away, you know, opportunity. And, and I felt he deserved the fight. I listened to what uh, Timothy Bradley one of the uh, commentators on the ESPN broadcast said he, he agreed. He thought he won the fight. I think the other guys uh, also thought that, that he deserved the fight. And uh, even, even – and look, the, the judging panel, I know all three of those guys, Dave Moretti, Weisfeld, and, uh, 
and uh, Tim Cheatham. They're all three excellent judges. I, I'm not, I don't, you know, to me, Steve Weisfeld is probably the best judge in boxing, frankly. Yeah. Dave Moretti has been one of the best judges in boxing for, you know, 35 years and is going to be in the Hall of Fame someday. And, uh, and Tim Cheatham is still an up and coming judge and is, you know, an excellent judge also uh, and, and a good dude. So they had to fight close for, uh, for Santian, um, which, which I didn't agree with. I felt like the other guy, DeMarco, probably won the fight by that same score. Again, but enough where I felt like he really won it. And the, and the, and the draw scorecard, you know, what can, or not the draw, the, the, uh, the Moretti card. I just, that one, uh, what can I say? Well, look. Um, it just shows you that boxing, it's back, and there's still always going to be controversy involved. Yeah, exactly. So, um, these events. From your ringside notes, what else was there to write home about? And are we going to get a little bit tired of these cards, Dan? Well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I give Top Rank a lot of credit for being able to bring the fights back. But at some, you know, and, and, and they've, they're, they've been a, some hit or miss. Some fights have been good. Some have not been so good. The main event last night, the fight I mentioned to you was really the co-feature. The main event was a, a bantamweight fight between uh, the contender Josh Greer looking to sort of cement that status against a Filipino fighter named Mike Plania. Yes. And uh, a lot of people thought Plania had a good chance to pull the upset. He did. He dropped, the, uh, he dropped Greer a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. Also then got the, you know, the well-deserved decision. Uh, it's a good win for him. And, you know, Greer... Uh, showed he's he's not quite yet at that level. Maybe he can get himself back. So it, that was a that last night's card overall in my mind of the three that have been done thus far. That was the best one, it seems to me. But you said or people didn't get tired of them. Um, look, they're doing a good job. They look nice on TV even without crowds. The production is good. The way Top Rank sets up the room with the video boards and everything is it looks sharp. Um, but at some point they're going to have to bring back to keep interest or or get more interest, bring back fights that are a little bit more meaningful. The TV ratings um, have been soft for sure. I don't know if that's partly because people just aren't used to having boxing on Tuesdays and Thursdays, as opposed to say Saturdays and sometimes Fridays. But I didn't think that would hurt necessarily because there's not a lot of other live sports going on at all, particularly in prime time. Um, so, you know, I'm not really sure uh, where that, you know, what, what that means exactly, but um uh, they're doing a good job bringing the fights back. So far, they're doing a good job with their protocols to make sure people don't contract the virus. And if somebody does, they're able to, you know, weed them out before they get in contact with other people. Um, but it's going to pick up as the summer goes on. They've got some other good matchups on paper. They have a world title fight coming up next week for the first time in a while. Uh, they have a nice fight later on between, uh, uh, you know, Joe Smith Jr. That's right. A leader Alvarez in an elimination fight, which is two, you know, legit top light heavyweight contenders that's supposed to take place next month. And, uh, you know, a bunch of other good names and prospects. So, you know, you know, they can make the bigger, better fights that we want to see. Well, one of the things, my point to make from over here with regard to them, with yeah. um, Frank Warren and um, Eddie Hearn both coming back in, in mid-July, is mm -hmm. that it was very disappointing that both BT Sports and uh, Sky Sports over here did not pick up the ESPN top ranked cards. And, you that know, was, they could at least have done it. Well, they could have at least done it for the first two weeks and shown eight hours of, of as live boxing in the next afternoon or made a feature of it the next night and had a couple of panelists in a studio or, you know, had me and you. Yeah, hey, no, hang, on a minute, hang on a minute. Had me and you just breaking it down and introducing it. No, but it was disappointing. And well, I suppose, you know, but here's the reason, do you know why? I mean, have you talked to anybody at Sky? Well, if you let me finish, Sky usually pick those type of shows up. Well, if you let me finish. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I spoke to Frank Warren about it. And basically, it looked to me, and, and I know Bob Aaron was disappointed, that BT Sport and Sky looked at it and thought, oh, there's no names on it. I mean, and to them, there were no names, so they didn't pick it up. I thought it was very short-sighted of them. They could have even had just done... Um, you know, basically, they could have picked up the 10 cards. It would not have cost money, would it? That's the point. It would, I mean, honestly, at this point, they probably could have got it for almost nothing. Uh, the way 20 grand are. each? 30 grand each? I'm not, I'm not, listen, I don't know what the dollar figure is. I just know that it would have been a lot. And, and, the re and I say that all the time, that whether you're Sky Sports or your BT Sport or you're any other network that, that is in the business of televising sports from wherever, uh, there's nothing else going on of any significance at the moment. I mean, I know supposedly Premier League is coming back. They have you know, ESPN in America has been showing, you know, Korean professional baseball uh, that they're bringing in that, that takes place, you know, often in the middle of the night, you know, so everybody's been looking for some kind of live activity. And, you know, particularly as Sky Sports 
you know, which is a, a subscription based network, you know, you got to have some programming for your viewers, I would think. And uh, so, yeah, I was kind of surprised by that, particularly, you know, in a BT sports situation, Frank Warren and Top Rank have such a close relationship exactly. and business together. You'd figure those would be for sure. Um, I've just had a nag from Doug Fisher, by the way, while we've been on. Uh, Ga hey, Gareth, friendly reminder, we'll need your UK column on Mike Tyson's visits to your side of the pond as soon as possible <laughs> if it's going to make in the next issue. Yes, give you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I have a story to get done for that issue also, so we're in good Exactly. So, hey, give us, give, us, give us five on that. Give us ten. <laughs> give us ten on that, big man. There you go. There we go. Our first ring mag... No, I think I was in the last one that you were in as well, anyway. But, um... So look, let, let's, yeah, it's a very weird thing that, but um, that they didn't, they didn't buy them up. I mean, but we would say that, wouldn't we, you know? Um, but, th but they should have. Um, before we go, uh, well, no, we're gonna do um, uh, viewers, uh, viewers and listeners or, and readers questions if you read Twitter um, as a separate show um, for show 10. No, maybe show 11. This is show 10. This is show 10. I should have mentioned at the be, beginning, yeah. we've reached double we figures. We we've made it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the, um, we're going to talk about two great fights from history now. Um, the first one being the one that you've just written a, a, a retrospective piece about for The Ring magazine. Uh, my, first, my first article... Well, I, had, I did an article for the Ring print edition that is the newest issue about Artero Gaddy for their special Gaddy Ward issue. But this was my first uh, piece that was done for the Ring website. And if you want to introduce the fight, and then we can talk about it. Well, it's the very, it's the brilliant, brilliant fight between the man known as Golden Boy, who now has a promotional company, Oscar De La Hoya, and the quite brilliant, and because he went on so long, people forgot how brilliant he was, Shane Mosley. Oh, their first fight was tremendous. We should mention, just for the sake of, uh, of uh, people knowing it, Oscar owns the Ring magazine now, but he actually didn't buy it until just, you know, many years after, yeah. uh, you know, after that fight took place, obviously. But anyway, look, they fought the first fight, uh, and it was, it was number one, and first and foremost, it's a great fight. I mean, if you like fights that are filled with action, that are fought between guys in their prime, guys who are at the top of their game, uh, who are very skillful, but also can fight, I mean, that fight had all of that. Uh, they were, it was a local rivalry because they were both from Los Angeles, so it was for L.A. bragging rights. It was the first ever fight that took place at Staples Center in Los Angeles, which uh, is the, the main arena of that city, which had just opened not that long before the fight. Um, and also, besides the fact that Oscar was welterweight champion and Shane had been lightweight champion, had moved up two weight classes, had took two fights in the welterweight division to prepare for this inevitable showdown with Oscar that everybody knew was going to take place at some point, uh, these guys were friends. They had fought in as kids, as uh, 11 or 12 in an amateur fight. They had sparred countless rounds here. They'd been in the same gym. They knew each other's families. Uh, and uh, so they, they called the fight destiny because both Oscar and Shane, you know, both figured like it was destiny that they were going to have to fight each other. And they finally did. And it was an electrifying night. It was, an, uh, and as I wrote in the piece, uh, because in addition to getting some uh, thoughts about the fight from Oscar, um, and the event and everything that went into it, you know, Dougie Fisher, the editor in Trooper Ring Magazine said, hey, you know, you could, I know it was your first, the first big fight that, that I ever covered in my career, just a few months after I'd started working at USA Today, even though I'd covered other fights, you know, put some of your own recollections in there also. So I, I weave some of my own uh, memories of that event in there. It was a remarkable night. I will never forget it. It remains to this day one of my favorite fights that I have ever covered or watched. It's, it's a super action fight. You know, people thought going in, you know, that uh, it was a, not, I won't say a pick em fight, but there was a lot of people uh, that, that were picking both guys. Matter of fact, in, in my research for the piece, I found the original uh, media picks box. Cause we would often in USA Today, you know, on the Friday before the big fight with whatever my main story was, we would, I would survey, you know, uh, 10 or 12 of the other reporters from the uh, main outlets that were there to cover the fight. So it's pretty cool when you take a look, you see the picks from 20 years ago. Uh, you know, the, the fight was 20 years ago, uh, today, uh, which, uh, you know, seems like a lifetime ago, which it was, I guess. But anyway, he's all the picks from everybody. It was pretty split among the top boxing writers of that time. Um, you know, I had picked Oscar De La Hoya. Uh, other, a lot of other guys picked Oscar, but a lot of guys were picking Shane Mosley to win that fight also. You know, by the way, if you hadn't picked him that night, you wouldn't have been writing for Ring Magazine now. 
<laughs> I don't think he knew the pick. I actually joke. It's funny when I interviewed Oscar earlier in the week about the fight for the story. You know, I jokingly said that. I said, by the way, and I read him down some of the picks because obviously these are all journalists that known. And oh, so who is it? Is it like Ron Borges and off the top of my head? I mean, people can look on the Ring website, and at the bottom of the story, there's the whole list. But it's like besides myself, it was people like Tim Smith, who was still working for the New York Daily News at the time, Eddie Schuyler, who was the yeah. Uh, Hall of Fame uh, Associated Press reporter. Brilliant writer. Brilliant writer. Yeah. Uh, the late George Kimball. From yes. The low, uh, from the Boston Herald at the time. Um, Jay Searcy, the great writer, the late great writer from the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, our good friend Rich Murata, who was doing boxing for Fox Sportsnet at the time. Uh, Michael Katz, who was writing for the old House of Boxing website after he had left the New York Daily News. I mean, it was just a, it's a who's who of of the top media uh, in boxing from 20 years ago. I mean, obviously it's not inclusive of everybody, but there was like a dozen uh, guys that I surveyed for that. And that was kind of cool to go back and- relive. Was Jerry in it? Was our friend Jerry in there? Jerry? Um, Jerry- Eisenberg? Um, Jerry Eisenberg? Jerry Eisenberg. No, he was not for, I mean, I don't know if he covered that fight, but he was not in that particular box. It was, it was limited to about 10 or 11 or 12 uh, different reporters. And I probably just, you know, didn't, didn't see him or didn't know him at that point and didn't, didn't ask him. But, uh, you know, but the point is, it was, a, it was an even kind of fight in people's minds. Yeah. And the thing, and you know this, Gareth, how often do you get a fight that there's so much hype for that fails to deliver? So this, it got a tremendous amount of hype. And it, 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 in my opinion, it surpassed what the hype was. I mean, you know, I remember, uh, you know, that, that not fight besides my own experience of being my first time covering Oscar or Shane or going to Los Angeles or even anywhere ever going to California, you know, it was also the first time I ever met Bob Arum, who's top ranked promoted the fight and his whole staff. And, you know, I, I detail some of the memories of that in the piece, you know, it was very memorable. I mean, you know, top rank did a great job promoting that fight. And, uh, you know, Staples Center was absolutely packed. And the big thing about it, Gareth, you know, you and I see a lot of famous movie stars and actors and sports people and this and that that are ringside at the big fights in Vegas. To me, that fight was the most star-studded fight I've ever right. seen. It includes, you know, Mayweather fights and Mike Tyson fights and other Oscar fights, Canelo, the big, big guys. There was everywhere you looked in, in Staples Center that night, no matter where you looked, there was a famous uh, movie person or a TV star or a politician or athlete. It was ridiculous. Because really, this was the period, if people don't realize it, this was the period where Mosley and Oscar De La Hoya, and you okay, think about what Bob's done in the context of all this. These were the great American, apart from the heavyweights, these were the Ameri great American boxing stars. And of course, five, six, seven years later, when Oscar met Floyd Mayweather, he took over, didn't he? Yeah. He took over. I mean, Bob, Bob was not the promoter of that fight because at that point, Oscar and Floyd had broken away and were doing their own thing. No, I mean, but that was the moment where, but Oscar was the biggest star. Yeah, no, and then, what I was going to say though is it was all the groundwork for those types of successful events were laid because Bob and his company had absolutely. done Absolutely. Good job. Look, Oscar at that time, and it's, it's easy that some people forget that. He was the superstar of boxing, period, in the United States and around the world. He was the uh, face of the sport. And every time he boxed, whether it was against a big name like a Shane Mosley or against somebody that was not as well known, you know, it was still a big, big event. And, uh, you know, he, he was, Oscar was smart enough in business where he knew that he didn't have to fight every fight on pay-per-view. He had his biggest fights on pay-per-view, but he came back often to regular HBO, you know, here and there, to do a fight where he took lesser money, maybe not against the, the best overall opponent, but it was a way to keep his name out there. And the thing that Bob and, and, and uh, Oscar did that was so brilliant was he would get in the ring and a lot of times, and then the Mosley fight was not one of them because nobody really kind of knew what was going to happen. But a lot of times uh, he would go into the fight and you already knew who the next opponent was going to be to the extent they would bring that opponent to the press conference. Yeah. And so a certain guy, the next guy was up and he was already there to promote the fight. And Oscar fought so often that, you know, it was just one promotion melded into the next. And it was a, it was a smart way for, for them to do. And that helped launch Oscar, uh, you know, as, not only a popular fighter, but a guy that just printed, printed money. I mean, he, whatever success that Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather have had on, on pay-per-view, and they have surpassed Oscar in terms of the, the gross revenues and the magnitude of some of their fights, that doesn't happen without Oscar De La Hoya, who set the groundwork for that and who gave both of them fights to help them launch themselves into that big time. Because Correct. Oscar, when, when, he, when he 
before he picked Manny and Floyd to fight, Manny and Floyd were fighting on pay-per-view and they were doing fine. They were doing modest numbers. They were being successful promotions, but they were doing like 300,000 buys, 330,000 buys, 350,000. And then when Oscar fought them, they got to that million level because that was such a big deal as Oscar being the biggest draw. And obviously with the Floyd fight over 2 million. 2.5, yeah. And, and then those guys were doing million after that on a regular basis because what he put them over into the general mainstream consciousness of sports fans in America and around the world. Correct. Listen, I'm going to talk about um, my fight in a minute. Just tell us briefly how you viewed the fight and how much you enjoyed the fight itself. Oh, I love the fight. I thought that Shane won. I mean, Shane ultimately... I, I, that's what I wanted from you, because I yeah. know you no. thought Shane won, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Shane, Shane won a split yeah. decision. Yeah. Um, it was a close fight. My, my take, and I've rewatched the fight because I was doing the piece, so I wanted to refresh my memory, but I didn't really need that because I watched the fight, you know, every few months anyway. But here's a look at that fight. Through like about six rounds, maybe through eight rounds, it was basically an even kind of fight. And what happened was Shane was able to make a few subtle adjustments with, the, with the, the distance and the way he was throwing his right hand. And he was able to get to Oscar a little bit more. Maybe Oscar was getting a little bit tired. And, uh, you know, Shane basically won the fight over those last, you know, three or four rounds where he, you know, he took the fight from Oscar. And if you listen, even like I, the commentary, you know, they even mentioned about how he was seizing the momentum. They had a brilliant 12th round where the fight could have still been on the table. And they just came out bombing away. It was just uh, electrifying. It was the best round of the fight. Uh, just a fantastic fight. Uh, a, the right decision. And, and to Oscar's credit, you know, on the night of the fight, and now 20 years later, he doesn't, doesn't take away from Shane. He says he won the fight fair and square. No excuses. He did tell the story, though. And it's, you know, you can read about it in the piece about what happened the night before that caused him a little bit of distress by eating uh, two dozen oysters at his favorite Mexican restaurant after the weigh-in. And he told me he had the runs all night. And uh, so his stomach was kind of a mess, but he didn't, he didn't use that as an excuse for losing. So you can run, but you can't hide. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, and by the way, it was, a, you know, Shane, you know, was a highly regarded undefeated fighter at that time, but he didn't really have the name on his record when he beat De La Hoya and he did so fair and square in a fantastic fight and became, uh, you know, not only a lightweight champion, but also winning a title in, a wel in the welterweight division by skipping over junior welterweight. After that victory, in, uh, you know, 20 years ago, June, there was a lot of people in boxing and fans around the world that at that point uh, tabbed Sugar Shane Mosley as number one boxer in the world pound for pound. Roy Jones was not as active as he was, had been. He had beefs with HBO. Floyd had not, had not yet got to that level, mm -hmm. Act not yet on the scene. And so at that moment in time, you know, there was, there was a lot of people that had Sugar Shane as number one pound for pound. And then when he came back and defended, you know, a few defenses – against not great opponents, but, but reputable opponents, Antonio Diaz, Shannon Taylor, um, you know, Adrian Stone, people like that. And he was knocking them out and just destroying them. You know, it was like Sugar Shane Mosley's pound for pound number one. Well, great. what a brilliant memory. Well, look, before this thing goes over the hour, and I refuse to go over the hour with this, um, I'm going back 40 years in a very similar scenario where yeah. Roberto Duran de Panama, de Piedras, uh, Manos de Piedra, um, of stone. Who, who, the Hands of Stone, who was a brilliant, like, unde undefeatable at lightweight, basically, is stepping up to fight one of the greatest boxers of all time in Sugar Ray Leonard, who's 23, and I think Duran would have been 29 then, because he was 69 this week, wasn't he? Yeah, um, Roberto, Roberto Duran turned 69 just uh, yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, and so this fight was two days from now, um, 40 years ago, um, the brawl in Montreal, it became known as eventually. Ray Arcel and Angelo Dundee in the corners, right? Hall of Famers. Hall of Famers. Ray Arcel, obviously, with Roberto Duran and, uh, and Angelo Dundee. Kind of, he was like a celebrity trainer by then, really. So he was stepping in, and it was partly for TV. But my word, I rewatched it last night. And even though it wasn't 12 rounds, it was 15 rounds, remember? And because Duran had said really profane things at Sugar Ray Leonard that he would take his, his woman, he would... He, I can't, I'm not going to repeat them on here because it's so you know, it, there, but. It's so funny that you, when people talk about that Duran, because I don't know that Duran. No, no. The mean, nasty beast. But, the, 
I've known is in the last, you know, number of years as a retired guy where he comes to fights and he's just this happy go lucky guy, always smiling, always hugging people. Listen, person. As, as Sugar Ray Leonard refused to dance that night in the ring and stood toe to toe, heavy legged with Duran and fought Duran's fight because he was so angry with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Duran was grinning in his corner every couple of rounds between rounds because he knew that he had fought, forced the master to fight his fight. I'm not joking now. I was sitting here. I've watched it before, but I watched it intensely last night to try and decide who, because it was a close fight, yeah? Okay. To really try and decide. And I, even after 15 rounds, my the, the, the nuance of the entire fight was that Duran won because... Because Leonard landed some amazing shots when he was under pressure and some amazing hooks and, and reposts at Duran. But unfortunately, he got caught fighting the style of Duran. Relentless, indefatigable, incredible engine. I mean, I think, I think they had one round, about round eight, where... Um, and they'd been grappling and clinching and punching all around. And Ferdy Pacheco, who was commentating that night, said, oh, they took a round off there. It's one of the most <laughs> exciting rounds you will generally see. Um, it's a fight you've seen as well, I'm sure. But it really, what I loved about it, again, it was a lightweight stepping up to face a welterweight. Well, remember, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that Duran had had a, a other fights as a welterweight before he fought. He no, he had, but... but Right. But also, um, Sugar Ray was undefeated at that point as well. So yeah, it was absolutely. one of those moments in time that if we had we been at it, I was 14, you know, and you were tiny. Um, had we been at it, it's one of those fights where we would have seen a power shift. Or it's a bit like, it's a bit like, if Terence Crawford comes up and beats Errol Spence now, he's come up to a third weight division and we might fancy oh, him oh, at oh, middleweight. You know what I mean? But, but Terence Crawford has been at welterweight for a while and has got a No, but, but he's fighting a guy who is brilliant at welterweight and who's never yeah. been beaten at welterweight and so, maybe too much of a challenge for him. And, you know, it's so, so it's, it's just one of those moments where these are, you know, they're called greats now willy-nilly, but that when you see, I've never seen so much relentless brilliance over 12 to 15 rounds. It's relentless. When you, even the commentators have got it wrong with, oh, Leonard's hurt. He wasn't hurt. He was, he, he was damaged into action. Oh, Duran's tiring. Well, three seconds later, he wasn't, you know? Well, the thing that's interesting to me about the fight, which nobody knew at the time, because you never know how the rest of history is going to play out, but, and it seems like a perfect way to start, Leonard Duran won was the first fight in what became the incredible round robin fights between Ray. Eight Rand, fights. Eight fights. Was and yeah. uh, and uh, Hagler, I thought it was nine fights. Actually. It's nine. Sorry. It is they they it bookended is it. So you yeah. had Leonard Duran won yeah. the first fight of that great foursome. And you then, you know, almost a decade later, at the end of 89, you had the third fight or the third fight between Leonard and Duran that closed that. So basically, for the entirety of the 1980s, starting in 1980 with their first fight, ending in 1989 with their third fight. You had all nine of the fights between the four kings that carried that decade of boxing and made it so popular, you know, in the post-Muhammad Ali era. And, you know, all due respect to Larry Holmes, who was a great champion and dominated the 1980s. And then, of course, you know, in the later part of that decade, you had uh, the, the, the prime Mike Tyson, who, who came in and just electrified the world. But those four kings, you know, they were the face of boxing you know, other than, say, Tyson when he won the title in 86. And they, they carried the sport and made huge events. And Leonard Duran won, which is the first fight of that group, is probably, in my estimation, if you had to rank all nine of their fights in terms of which were the best fights, obviously Hagler Hearns is number one. Number two is probably Leonard Hearns, the first fight. Number three is probably Duran Leonard won. And, you know, if you were making the, the, the official ranking of the nine from, from best to, to, to not as best. Dan, you've talked to me out and I'm going to say two words. No mass. I'll see you next time. I'll see you next time. All right.